introduce Dr. Keaton. So she is a professor of history at Tuscaloosa University. She's in their history and museum studies department. Um, she's spoken at the museum before, and we're again we're so thrilled to have her. She received her PhD or earned her PhD at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, she won the Carl Bode Award for best article, and I love this article's name: "Backyard Desperados." Uh, American Attitudes Concerning Toy Guns, and is currently working on a manuscript about the post-World War II period examining firearms in the United States. Um, and she's here today to talk about some fascinating pieces. Dr. Keaton, if you're ready, take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, we'll jump right in and get started. If you wanna move to the first slide here. Right. When we look at these objects, we see a variety of things. Um, these are pretty interesting. We have a painted radio and it looks like a chalk painted uh, dresser there. Let's look at the next slide as well. Yeah, it's the, we may think this is an attempt at recycling. Um, some people call it upcycling, repurposing. Uh, we, we may be tempted to think someone's watching too much HDTV or Pinterest, um, or they have too much free time and too much chalk paint. Um, or we might see that these are historical sources, just like diaries, letters, and newspapers. For historians, these items are important artifacts, hidden under layers of paint and good intentions. There's nothing wrong with repurposing, updating, recycling, whatever you wanna call it, antiques and vintage items, but let me offer that there is an additional way to use these pieces as historical sources, specifically as sources for frontier history where textual sources are usually pretty scarce. Specifically, how do we reconstruct the history of a place as remote from the present day as it was from quote unquote civilization in the late 18th and early 19th centuries? How can we learn about a people who leave few, if any, written records behind? That problem's compounded by the mountains of books and films and TV shows that together over the course of over a century have created a mythic frontier in addition to the real one, um, one inhabited by Disney and Hollywood um, more than any real settlers. How can we get at the actual experience of living in what was then termed the back country? Uh, a place known to us as Tennessee, um, as you'll see on the, the next slide. Um, we knew it, know it now as East Tennessee, but many Easterners at the time have described as an uninhabited wasteland and refuge for criminals. Um, yeah, and there it is depicted as a, a, a wild, untamed place in this 19th century painting. Um, well, we look at what they left behind, um, those materials and goods that they made and used as they built communities and families in that so-called uninhabited wasteland. So to begin, we're going to examine the wasteland and those quote unquote criminals, the place and the people that form the context for our object. Um, as land became harder to obtain in the East, in places such as Pennsylvania, many people looked West. Accelerating this trend were the land grants given to Revolutionary War soldiers. Although some veterans did end up occupying their lands, the majority of those land grants ended up in the hands of land speculators. In addition, many settlers continue the trend of previous decades, crossing the Appalachians and taking the land by occupying it, a practice known as 
swatting. And as you can see on the next slide, they arrived very uh, through various routes. Here's the back country we can see in the middle there, I've been arrow pointing to, to what we now know as Tennessee. Um, on the next slide, there's a great image of the Great Road. Um, and this is one of the most traveled routes into the eastern portion of East Tennessee. Um, the Great Road eventually led settlers from Pennsylvania to Northeast Tennessee. Some crossed the mountains into Tennessee from North Carolina as well, but they all had one thing in common. They were searching for land. As a result, by 1800, about one fifth of the American population lived in the territory between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi, the area that came to be known as the back country. Who were these people? Many came from, or at least through Pennsylvania and had originated from German lands. Frontier Tennessee also became home to many Scots-Irish. Some settlers of French origin, like our famous John Sevier, slaves, and an already established population of Native Americans. But the attitudes toward white settlers, be they German, French, or Scots-Irish, were less than favorable. One minister traveling through the frontier described the inhabitants in this way, quote, they were great oddities to me. After service, they went to reveling, drinking, singing, dancing, and whoring. And most of the company were drunk before I left the spot. They were as rude in their manners as the common savages and hardly a degree removed from them. Their dresses almost as loose and naked as the Indians and differing in nothing save complexion." End quote. In 1785, the Secretary of State, Timothy Pickering, wrote to then diplomat Rufus King, quote, the immigrants to the frontier lands are the least worthy subjects in the United States. They are little less savage than the Indians. And when possessed for the most fertile spots, for want of work, they live miserably." End quote. Dr. Benjamin Rush, a noted signer of the Declaration of Independence, described his home state of Pennsylvania as a sieve that retained the hardiest settlers of good character while leaking the unsavory dregs southward into the frontier. Those dregs provoked a lot of hand wringing among Easterners. For one thing, they worried about their loyalty to the new nation. Americans, particularly Federalists, were uncertain about the allegiance of these settlers, fearing they could be easily brought to support the French and or the Spanish both of which still occupied lands near the Mississippi. Residents of and those making their way to the frontier were deemed, quote, ripe for treason and spoil, end quote. And given the limited scope and tenuous authority of the new government, they had reason to worry, believing them to have little to no education and even less inclination to attend church, Easterners, George Washington and among them, worried profusely about what these, quote, mangy varmints infesting the land, end quote, might do, unsupervised, on the frontier. Federalist Senator Rufus King warned that, quote, it was dangerous to put arms into the hands of the frontier people for their defense, lest they should use them against the United States." End quote. Even the character of these people was in question. The frontier settlers were considered vagrants, swarming like pests 
However, the Appalachians to claim land they did not own and would not improve. By the early 19th century, hope had dwindled that these so-called quote-unquote crackers and squatters would become civilized. Social commentators, not just politicians, reserved their most potent venom for them. Setting their pens in motion, they created the image of, quote, the white savage, a ruthless brawler and eye gouger, dwelling in a dingy log cabin with yelping dogs at his heels, a haggard wife, and a mongrel brood of brown and yellow brats to complete the sorry scene, end quote. In the state of Franklin, later our Tennessee, clashes between squatters and speculators fueled the creation of more degrading stereotypes. Even the first governor of the Tennessee Territory, William Blunt, was not immune from the name calling, having been dubbed Dirt Captain. And when the federal government had to send troops into the area multiple times between 1787 and 1811 to deal with the squatters, the perception of a region peopled with lawless degenerates grew. Federalists in Congress embraced these stereotypes and consequently firmly opposed statehood for Tennessee in 1796. One of the most active opponents, Rufus King, a noted defamer of frontier settlers who had long voiced his suspicions in Congress. But were these fears and slander warranted? Were the frontier settlers dregs drained from other states? Were they backward and savage? And how can we know? They left few written documents behind defending themselves or even telling us anything about them. They did, however, leave objects behind, and those objects hold volumes of information. By evaluating the items they made and used, we can peek into the lives of white frontier settlers. So today we will be looking at a few of these pieces. If analyzed carefully, they challenge assumptions about frontier settlement in multiple ways. First, early American settlers, especially those in Tennessee, were far from barbaric vermin infesting the frontier region. But they were also far from the stereotypical rugged, independent pop culture pioneer that cut ties with the East while cutting a path through the wilderness. In the case of Tennessee, settlers created a distinctive culture. But they also maintained ties to the national political landscape. In some cases, they even retain international connections as materials and ideas made their way across the Appalachians to the so-called backcountry. We find all of this in their material culture. And if we look on the next slide, the first thing we're going to look at is a rope and tassel cupboard. Um, the people of East Tennessee, as the cupboard will show, did not abandon their ideas of gentility and refinement on the side of the Great Road. In their furniture, which they constructed after they arrived in Tennessee, we see that they still cared about and sought ways to exhibit gentility through their use of rope and tassel ornamentation. Um, I've also, throughout some of the next slides um, as we progress through, you'll see that on one side I'll have a piece of material culture and on the other side some of the quotes um, from people in the late 18th, and especially early 19th century, about people on the frontier and people on the Tennessee frontier. Um, and we can move on to the next slide so that we can get a close up. Here we go of those rope and tassel ornaments on this piece of furniture. The first rope and tassel pieces are found in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Baltimore was an early 
American leader in style. But surprisingly, this motif made its way to Tennessee, specifically in the limestone area of Northeast Tennessee. So how did an ornamentation from an elite urban center arrive near Jonesboro on Big Limestone Creek via Hugh McAdams, a settler from Baltimore, Maryland? McAdams made several rope and tassel pieces, including the one pictured here. We know that McAdams had the tools to do this kind of work because we have the record of his estate auction. Many of the items auctioned after his death were tools for furniture making, including all of the materials needed for advanced inlay work. That McAdams' primary job was a furniture maker is clear from the large numbers of such tools. But Hugh McAdams' estate auction reveals much more. Two of the items in the estate auction were slaves. These slaves, Moses and Sarah, likely performed agricultural labor that helped feed the family and freed Hugh McAdams to work on furniture. Families' food supplies largely depended on what they could produce themselves on the frontier. One cannot farm for a family and make labor-intensive pieces of furniture, so slave labor filled in. Slave labor made cabinetry possible, even if in an indirect way. But what of this rope and tassel motif? In one way, the particular rope and tassel of McAdams and other Nolichucky Valley artisans is distinct. For the Baltimore School emphasized simplicity and restraint, the East Tennessee rope and tassel inlays are detailed exuberant and coupled with an abundance of other inlays, as you can see on the bottom doors there. Even the use of the rope and tassel motif by McAdams and other local artisans sets East Tennessee apart. While leaders in furniture style declared that inlay was no longer in fashion by 1803, East Tennessee makers embraced it well beyond that time creating pieces with a profusion of inlay and even creating new inlay techniques. Yet in another way, the use of rope and tassel shows how East Tennessee maintained cultural connections with the East. The use of tassels had a long established tradition that persisted into the late 18th century and early 19th century in the U.S. and Europe. And we can see on the next slide two portraits that exemplify this. Uh, when artists wanted to highlight their subject's wealth when painting a portrait, they painted a tassel and drapery in the background. So it was more than just a backdrop to the sitter, it was symbolic. Textiles trimmed and embellished with cords and tassels denoted luxury, wealth, and refinement. And we can see some more examples on the next slide. The art of trimming textiles with cords and tassels even had its own name, passementry. Here we have an early, this originates in France, one of the early French tassels, and there's the loom used to make them. And then we can see on the next slide that using here, here's the more examples of this. These are um, wallpaper examples from a home in Kentucky. Um, and of course, we've seen this show up on East Tennessee furniture. So East Tennessee makers were not divorced from national or even international trends. In employing passementry into inlaid furniture, they crafted a distinctive style while also maintaining a connection to a much broader culture of gentility and refinement. Thus, rural homes were not filthy log cabins inhabited by uncivilized outlaws. Instead of being peopled by bandits and lawless persons, 
Tennessee frontier communities like Big Limestone Creek were composed of skilled craftsmen who blended their creativity with cultural trends, at times free to do so by slave labor. Speaking of East Tennessee material culture or even Tennessee material culture at all, without discussing the Bergner family would be unthinkable. Um, so our next slide highlights a piece of Bergner work. The Bergners traveled the Great Road, eventually arriving in the Horse Creek area of Washington and Greene counties. Interestingly, the family hailed from Pennsylvania and in Dr. Benjamin Rush's description, they would have been some of the dregs that oozed from the sieve of Pennsylvania. By 1812, the Bergner family owned land in both Washington and Greene counties. Several of the Bergner sons became noted furniture makers. One of the most prolific was John C. Bergner, the maker of the piece here known as the Blackburn Broils sideboard. One of its most intriguing elements is its musical drawer that we can see in the next slide. Upon opening that drawer, the top, the, a quill is strummed across a stringed instrument concealed inside. Bergner used the same technique on a secretary desk he made for William Patton in 1819. And I believe it's on the next slide. Yes, there it is. It's obvious that the degrading remarks about frontier settlers are outrageous when surveying this and many other Bergner pieces. But what else can we learn? A trademark of many Bergner pieces is the use of highly figured wood, burled walnut, tiger maple, and curly maple were staples of the Bergner workshop. And you can see their creative use of wood there in that top drawer in the middle. Those woods were abundant in the frontier forests of East Tennessee, and the Bergners especially liked to use the burls and knots to add ornamentation to their pieces. Rather than relying on inlays or imported woods to enliven their pieces, the Bergners chose to employ local woods in creative ways, like sawing a single burl into matching veneer pieces. Um, and the next slide is another example of the Bergner's fine work that really showcases their use of wood. It's currently in the Dixon Williams Mansion in downtown Greenville. There we go. Thus, the Bergner workshop reveals that East Tennessee craftsmen were not afraid to forge their own style. The elaborate, sometimes musical pieces they made also reveal a customer base with refined taste living in the backcountry. But a careful study of the Bergner workshop also reveals that most of the pieces they made were simple and utilitarian revealing that the majority of their customers were not wealthy. But were they the vermin that so worried Easterners? It's unlikely when we look at those humble yet functional pieces called work stands. So our next slide should picture two work stands. These are from East Tennessee. They have not been verified as Bergner pieces, but we do know from the, Ver the Bergner surviving workbook uh, where they recorded all of the pieces that they made, that they made quite a few work stands. So these would have been everywhere in East Tennessee. And many of these came out of the Bergner workshop. If the primary piece of furniture crafted by the Bergners was the work stand, then we know that the majority of their customers were indeed of simple means. For the work stand, plain compared to the grand sideboard and musical desk, demonstrate industry because the work stand facilitated work, specifically the handwork of sewing. 
Preparing clothing for one's home in the early 19th century was no small chore for women. They often grew the flax, spun the fibers, and completed all the other labor necessary to produce textiles. Then it had to be dyed, cut, and sewn into presentable garments. Even a simple shift of homespun required seasons and hours of labor. Much of that labor, at least the hand sewing portion, was facilitated by the work stand. The work stand then is a symbol of industry and domesticity, two characteristics often lacking in those degrading descriptions of the frontier, where women were often described as such. Quote, the young women have a most uncommon practice, which I cannot break them of. They draw their shift as tight as possible to the body and pin it close to show the roundness of their breast and slender waist, for they are generally finely shaped, and draw their petticoat close to their hips to show the fineness of their limbs. They expose themselves often quite naked, without ceremony, rubbing themselves and their hair with bear's oil and tying it up behind in a bunch like the Indians, being hardly one degree removed from them." End quote. This preacher's portrait of frontier women is jarring when considering the reality more than denoting that sewing was taking place. The stand also reveals a desire to organize and order one's home. Drawers kept needles, thread, thimbles, and other sewing materials out of sight and organized. Smaller pieces of sewing could be put away to reduce clutter while also being kept clean by these work stands. The stands also remind us of the presence of women and their integral role in household production and survival on the frontier. And in the next slide, we do have a wonderful example of the work Tennessee women were crafting at the same time that description was written about them. Um, the State Museum has this eagle quilt. It was created by Rebecca Foster in 1808. The eagle is certainly a statement of loyalty to the nation, made more important since this was crafted on the eve of the War of 1812, underscoring that sentiment are the oval frames surrounding the eagle, each one featuring the embroidered name of a state in a patriotic verse. The blue printed fabric, according to the State Museum, would have been imported again, denoting those connections to the quote unquote outside world, but the white linen appears to be hand spun and hand woven, maybe even by the quilter herself, Rebecca Foster. But most of our discussion today focuses on the craftsmen at work, but be reminded that their work was made possible by women. Men freed from the constraints of childcare food preparation, healing, birthing, growing, sewing, could pursue a trade. In addition, from the view of the stand, the frontier was a family enterprise, since women sewed for the adornment of kin and home, making everything from shirts and quilts to household decor. These industrious women seemed to be a far cry from the quote, swearing, lazy, idle sluts, end quote, that one commentator of the time called, <clears throat> excuse me, Appalachian frontier women. <clears throat> as much as material culture tells us about families gathered around hearths at home, it also points to surprising connections with national issues and international commerce. So, Let's look now at the McClure desk in the next slide. Yes, in the 1820 Federal Manufacturer Census, 
William McClure's name appears as a cabinet maker in Greenville, Tennessee. Much of McClure's life, except for that census entry, is lost to history. But one of McClure's pieces survives and usually graces the front gallery of the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. Facing a regal federal secretary from Annapolis and flanked by ornate pieces from prominent urban southern cities of the early American era. Not too bad for a backcountry savage. With the fall board closed, the desk is unremarkable. There's little ornamentation um, going on there. But on the next slide, you'll see that when you open the fall board, the viewer is treated to an exuberance of inlay, hardly exceeded by any regional piece of the period. The gallery comes to life with a centered vernacular eagle framed by an arch topped with 17 stars, vine and leaf inlay, and inlaid quarter fans. The prospect drawers boast more inlays in geometric patterns while the pigeonholes are framed with scallops. The desk is truly a work of art. Like many of his contemporaries, McClure was born in Ireland and came to the frontier of Washington County, Tennessee with his parents. He likely apprenticed in nearby Washington County and would have become familiar with similar inlaid furniture being produced in the shop of Hugh McAdams. And he could have even apprenticed with McAdams, who was also a Scots-Irish Presbyterian like the McClure family. After marrying, McClure established his shop in Greenville, where the census captured his presence in 1820. But by 1830, he moved to the middle of the state. That he was a Presbyterian might suggest to modern observers that McClure was a sober-minded religious individual. But at the time, not everyone thought so highly of the denomination. One traveler through the backcountry characterized them in a series of colorful descriptions. Quote, they are enemies to Christ and his cross, are these vile Presbyterians. And they are a licentious gang of Presbyterians. But the worst scorn was reserved for a certain type. The quote, ignorant, mean, worthless, beggarly Irish Presbyterians, the scum of the earth, and the refuse of mankind. End quote. Now, we can't evaluate the state of McClure's soul, but in other ways, he fits the eastern image of the frontier figure. A migrant whose family sought land on the frontier, he failed to establish any roots and kept moving away from settled territory, leaving Greenville by 1830. But more importantly, he defies those descriptions. A Presbyterian, his presence indicates that migrants retained religious religious affiliations brought with them rather than abandoning them. In addition, the census indicates that his shop was industrious. In 1820, he employed three additional men and consumed 7,800 board feet of mahogany, cherry, walnut, and poplar. So apparently he didn't fit the description of the beggarly Presbyterian at the very least. The desk itself reveals even more. Likely it was made for Captain Joseph Kirk, who served as the captain in the East Tennessee militia during the War of 1812. The number of stars suggests that it was made between 1803, when Ohio joined the Union, in 1812, when Louisiana became a state. Not only then was McClure aware of national political events, given the 17 stars, but he, or at least his customer, 
were certainly no frontier traders conspiring with the French or Spanish. There could be no doubt that when the owner lowered the fall board to conduct business, the message was clear. Allegiance to the Republic, symbolized by the eagle and other neoclassical elements, is the defining feature of the piece. Given the disparaging attacks on frontier settlers' characters and loyalties so prevalent in this period, the desk may have also served as a rebuttal, showcasing patriotism, craftsmanship, and creativity. It seems that both maker and owner may have had something to prove or at least wanted to make a statement. The ornamentation is notable in another way. The mainstream style of the period, often referred to as neoclassical or federal, emphasized simplicity, restraint, and subtlety. And while the outside of the desk conforms to that style, the gallery defies all of those aesthetic standards. Its variety of inlay motifs combined with the sheer volume of inlays produces a bold, exuberant patriotism that challenges stereotypes while also shaping a new frontier character, one that celebrated an independent creativity informed by Eastern traditions, but shaped by the skill, materials, and frontier identity of the craftsman. In short, backcountry craftsmen buffeted by slander and unable or unwilling to embrace the Federalist notion of patriotism, were beginning to craft their own identity, quite literally. This frontier patriotism still incorporated pride for and service to the Republic. After all, McCourt's customer who bought the desk and Hugh McAdams, uh, the maker of our earlier cupboard, served in the War of 1812, as did a record number of Tennesseans, but it also celebrated the frontier. Excessive by Eastern standards, bold and unrestrained, this desk and other inlaid pieces make this new identity tangible. At the very least, the desk reveals that Tennessee was not populated by traitorous rebels. Instead, they painstakingly embedded symbols of the Republic, literally, into their material lives. And in the next slide, we'll see it's also evident that frontier craftsmen were also familiar with the political ideologies of the New Republic. Craftsmen often included neoclassical motifs like lyres, pictured on the tins of this pie press, into their work. The lyre is an instrument associated with the Greco-Roman world. It evoked those Mediterranean civilizations, both of which the founders looked to in creating the American Republic. You can also see another lyre chosen on the next slide for another pie press. So while the founders read Greco-Roman works um, by the likes of Cicero, the motifs associated with those civilizations found their way onto frontier furniture. But these pieces also demonstrated ties to it influences from a wider economic sphere. Um, so next we're going to talk about a mahogany table on the, there we go. Most of the mahogany consumed by American makers came from Cuba in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Most likely, then, the wood in this particular table traveled from Cuba. There's also a possibility that it could have come from Honduras or Santo Domingo. Mahogany trees were sought after because it's a strong, dense wood that is used for many applications. Some specimens feature swirling grains and vivid hues that can range from bright red to a deep brown color. 
These could be manipulated to achieve various aesthetic effects. As a result, it was a preferred wood for affluent buyers eager to purchase showy furniture. In response to growing consumer demand, mahogany imports to Europe and colonial North America rose steadily, and consequently, many of the leading sources of commercially harvested mahogany were over-harvested or depleted by the mid to late 1700s, resulting in periodic shortages, escalating prices, and growing competition. You can see on the next slide, there's a, a better look of, there we go, some of the grain. You can see why people would seek mahogany as a material to make these with. Diminishing supplies ensured that mahogany retained its commercial value and its reputation as a high status luxury commodity. After the Revolutionary War, British timber merchants and shippers attempted to block American ships from the most lucrative aspects of the mahogany trade. Um, fortunately for the makers of American furniture, those efforts largely failed, mostly because the Americans proved, proved to be very good trading partners. They brought to the Caribbean what the mahogany workers needed most, which was food. British ships often arrived empty, American ships often arrived with food, um, one food item that they especially uh, like to transport, they knew they had a big customer base for, was butter. So with most of the population engaged in the extraction of wood, rather than farming, settlers in the mahogany fields were dependent on imported foods, especially for the logging camps. The wood in this table then, linked Tennessee craftsmen with the Atlantic import-export trade. The mahogany arriving in East Tennessee, however, could also travel up the Mississippi and across the state because much of the trade west of the Appalachians actually occurred with merchants from the west, not the east. Again, inflaming those fears that frontier settlers were becoming too friendly with the Spanish and French. At any rate, we see that although it was deemed the backcountry, settlers were obtaining goods from as far away as the forest of the Caribbean. In addition, we also see why families like the Bergners would prefer local woods that featured ornamental grains as opposed to sourcing expensive mahogany. Being at the mercy of an international economy and fledgling transportation networks, Tennessee craftsmen chose local woods and in the process created distinctive furniture like that of the Bergners in the search for substitutes. Other international influences crept into the work of Tennessee artisans, and we'll see on the next slide, inspiration from Gothic architecture, especially from churches. Uh, you can see this particular cabinet um, has replicated the arches in some of these Gothic cathedrals. And we can see yet another international influence in the next slide, in the adoption of chinoiserie. Chinoiserie is the practice of imitating or evoking Asian themes and motifs in Western art. Uh, we have, a, you can see there um, in the textiles in the above painting, uh, the use of those screens as the Asian motif is often replicated in the work on glass doors and some of these cabinets. Um, and then on the next slide, we have another example of chinoiserie at work, um, imitating the corners of pagodas. Um, this was a nice crossover again to the spires on the cathedral. And I've made a note there, we, we've seen the passementary show up again in the carved tassel on that cupboard. Um, 
I should also note that chinoiserie is often the Western perception of what is Asian. That they're not always terribly accurate in their representation of um, Asian animals, people, art. Um, it's not always 100% accurate. And we've got one more slide here, I think that, yes, here we go. Um, it's incredibly popular. Um, the late 1700s, throughout the 19th century, to import uh, blue and white porcelains. Um, here's one that's picturing a pagoda, and you can see again some of those influences. Let's go back one slide here. Sorry, Angela. Oh, oh that's okay. Trying to do a terrible job. Is it this one? Uh, next one. There we go. Yeah. So this cabinet's got three of these kind of for just outside influences happening here. Um, the imitation of the Asian architecture, the passamentary, those are carved or open tassels, um, an applied ornament on this cabinet, and then the scallops are another Gothic architecture influence that cabinet makers like to apply. And this is actually a cupboard that was made in Greene County, Tennessee. This frontier material culture held multiple influences from well beyond the backcountry, whether they were political, economic, or artistic. But craftsmen were no mere imitators. Using available resources and their own creativity, they created works of art that acted as rebuttals to the accusations, like those of one observer, that it would, quote, require much time to cultivate the manners and morals of these wild peoples. And you can see on the next slide here that there are people um, speaking out, not just in their furniture, but also in their words. Um, Joseph Doddridge um, was a playwright who wrote some work celebrating the residents of the backcountry. And I have a quote from him here um, showing his admiration um, for these people. Ultimately, these pieces are often overlooked unless it's by collectors. But there's a lot for historians and Tennesseans to appreciate and learn from these pieces. Primarily, they are a reminder of our rich frontier heritage and challenge the notions that Tennessee was a land of eye-gouging savages. Instead, creative and industrious people lived and worked here. Also, you can see the direct connections between Tennessee and the broader world through materials and their style influences. In addition, we can also learn that there was an independent spirit here and a creativity inspired by Tennessee by the choices artisans made in regard to materials and ornamentation. Moreover, these pieces show us that a region can establish and develop ties to a larger political entity without fear of losing its distinctiveness. In other words, Settlers were simultaneously Americans and Tennesseans without losing their identity as either. Finally, these pieces may even tell us something about ourselves. Centuries removed from the humble work stand, which we no longer need, or the grand sideboard, which we no longer have room for. If we doubt the state of the future, we need look no further than our past. In a globally connected world, the likes of which our frontier forebears could never have imagined, we need not fear trading our local or regional cultural heritage for an iPhone that's made in Germany but assembled in China. We need only to look to the items we still produce, handcrafts, art, and food, or to the things we pass down, quilts, blanket checks, crocs, and the many items preserved by museums 
to reassure us that making and having ties with the larger world need not and will not erase our Tennessee roots or American identity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Keaton. And thank you for bearing with my terrible PowerPointing. I want oh, to check no and problem. see. Uh, that was so fascinating and gives so much meaning to what we do in museums. I'm going to pull up questions really quick, if that's okay with you. Sure. We just have a few minutes and we'll wrap up. Um, if you are still thinking about a question to our audience, go ahead and submit it here. And we also have a survey if you don't mind filling that out. It's very quick and we would love it. We did get a question. What is the secondary word on the Green County dining table? And what is the provenance of that table? That table was auctioned, let's see. I do not remember the year that the table was auctioned. And I believe I have in my notes everything about the construction of it. I don't remember offhand what the secondary wood was. I, I'm going to guess it's probably tulip poplar. That's the most prevalent um, secondary wood. Um, let's see if I can find in my notes here. So I have the measurements and everything. Oh, wow. Very detailed. Um, yes, tulip poplar is the secondary wood. It, it's not, the table wasn't in the greatest shape, but there's a tremendous amount of mahogany on it. And it, it had multiple repairs. So unfortunately, it was not taken good care of. So the, the, the secondary was... To a polar, I'm looking for the provenance here. That I may not have. Um, That's okay. No, I do not have the the provenance for that one. That's all right. It's a beautiful table. Oh, of all the artifacts and material culture that you showed in this PowerPoint with such wonderful images. What is your favorite? What is um, one that stands out to you the most? I really like the desk. Um, I, I love that eagle. It doesn't look very eagle-like on the, the first, <laughs> first glance, but um, I like it because it doesn't look like an eagle. This is someone's interpretation or perception of, of what it would be, but it's so, pay uh, on the one hand, it's someone striving to be very American and very patriotic, but on the other hand, they have definitely went their own way and how they manifested that sentiment on the desk. I, I think it's my favorite. That's a good one. And then it looks like the last question, what made you want to research this topic? What drew you to a presentation like this? I like studying ordinary people. Um, the, the people that are the hardest to study because they don't leave written records. Um, I mean, it's fun to study George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and all of those people because they have stacks and stacks and stacks of things that they have wrote. Uh, that people wrote to them, but it's much harder to get at ordinary people. So one of the only ways to do that is to look at what they produced. Um, so I, that's the short answer to that question. Yeah, absolutely. All right. It looks like that is it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for um, pushing through any technical difficulty. It was so worth it. Um, and we're just so glad to have you. Hopefully we have you in person again before too long. Thank you to all our participants. Uh, this will be online. We recorded it. You can check it out on our website later or if you want to share it with anybody. Um, and until next time, thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.